everybody. Welcome to Confirm My Rude Chat. Episode 7. Using a slightly different video setup here, so I've got no idea what part of my face uh, you're looking at at the moment. Um, but with my video skills, I'm going to ensure that you can see my face. Um, because as they say, uh, if you own a Matisse, uh, don't hang it in your cupboard. So, what I thought I'd do tonight, it's been a long time since we last had a chat. Um, episode 6 uh, was the incredibly awkward chat between Sam and myself via Zoom. Um, possibly the first Zoom call emanating from the state of Queensland. Um, so tonight, I'm going to feature two wines, which are out at the moment. Both of them are a type of Pinot. We've got Pinot Gris from our vineyard and a Pinot Noir from our good friend Rusty's vineyard in Crow Ridge. And as just a way to turn a semi-interesting conversation to a really boring one, what I thought I'd do is uh, shoehorn in uh, a little bit of science. Uh, and... Because we're in the midst of a pandemic, I'm going to shoehorn in the coronavirus as well. So let's talk about two wines made during the coronavirus pandemic, which are from varieties, which are only like they are because of the activities of viruses. And to explain this, what I'm going to do is show you a few snippets uh, from the internet um, to explain what I'm dribbling on. And I literally will be dribbling on um, because I'm thoroughly um, underprepared. So the first one that I'm going to be consuming while dribbling uh, is, I'm not I'm sure if you can see this because I can't see myself on the screen, is the over and over Pinot Noir, as I said, from Quarry Ridge. Um, in Kilmore, just north of Melbourne. Uh, delicious little Pinot that we made here in Kampiramaru HQ in Melbourne. Now, as we know, Pinot Noir is an enigmatic and elusive variety. It can be hard to make. Hard to make because it's got quite weak um, molecular uh, sort of colour structure. Uh, and can be a little bit low in the supporting tannins, which actually uh, helps support the colour to keep that the wine vibrant, um, fresh and young. This wine, uh, I like to think like all our Pinots, uh, particularly the one we make up at our own vineyard in Whitlands, is got a bit of that um, really nice, true Pinot sort of... Um, forest flavour, bam, uh, brambery um, spectrum to it. So it's not necessarily the, the tannins and acid that are driving this Pinot, but the actual true uh, Pinot fruit. Now, Pinot is such an interesting variety. It's interesting because there's what's called interclonal variation and intra clonal variation. So that means within the variety Pinot Noir, we see not only variation between separate cultivars of Pinot Noir called clones, so separate breeding stock, which have been propagated separately to try and separate out different features. So we see heaps of that. We also see variation within clones themselves. So Varieties which should be genetically identical, identical because they're what's called vegetatively propagated. So clones, identical clones are taken of a clone, so they should be identical. We start seeing them vary as well. So this is a puzzling, puzzling concept because it's why, why uh, these genetically identical Pinot Noir vines are starting to look different. It's like you have triplets, and all of a sudden at the age of 40, uh, triplets start looking a little bit different, um, which would be extremely odd. Um, 
So why is that the case? Well, the reason for it is actually a type of a virus. So this is where I'm shoehorning in the coronavirus. So it's a type of a virus called retrotransposon. Retrotransposons are also known as jumping genes. And these are little sections of RNA which can jump in and out of the genome of an organism. And they can jump from the genome of one organism into the genome of another. They're pretty much the simplest type of organism or non-organism that you can find. Now, what's incredible about them, we'll get back to the vines, is they were discovered by a just beast-level scientist uh, called Barbara McClintock um, in, I think, the 30s and 40s. And then she, of course, um, published her work and was completely ignored. Um, one, no doubt, because she was a woman. Uh, two, because no one understood it. She was so far advanced that literally no one else had even um, begun to think about the germ of the entire concepts that she was presenting. So it was ignored um, and in some sections uh, lampooned and ridiculed um, until it was rediscovered in the early 1970s. And then someone was nice enough to go, oh, hang on a minute. Um, actually, uh, Professor McClintock discovered that uh, over two decades ago, um, and everyone ignored it. So the story of Barbara McClintock and her scientific career is a fascinating one. Finally given a Nobel Prize for discovering jumping genes in 1983, as it says here on the Nobel uh, Prize website. Uh, well worth a read. Uh, fascinating scientist. Uh, literally gave up publishing her scientific work after the 1950s when she was just sick of being ignored. So what do retrotransposons uh, look like? I think I've brought up... Uh, no, I haven't. Oh, here we go. This is off um, Wikipedia. And it just shows how these retrotransposons work. So imagine now, maybe to get it back to Pinot, this down here is the Pinot Noir DNA. So it's a chromosome of Pinot Noir. And we have this little retrotransposon, which has jumped in at some point into the DNA of Pinot Noir. And then it's been propagated. And so now we have a separate plant of the same clone of Pinot Noir. So say it's 777, everyone's favorite 777. Let's say it's a 777 clone of Pinot Noir. And there's a whole lot of Burgundian people sort of going, oh, 777, it's fantastic. And then... They plant it out, and all of a sudden, this jumping gene jumps out of the genome, cruises around, and jumps back in again, but in a different spot. And when it jumps in back into the DNA, it actually disrupts whatever part of the genome of the chromosome that it jumped back into. So it might jump into a separate gene, which may have some influence on color, and all of a sudden, our what we thought was a 777 clone with standard sort of beautiful colour, all of a sudden is a little bit lighter or a little bit darker or the bunches are a little bit looser or they're a little bit tighter or the leaves look a little bit different. And then a whole lot of very serious wine people stand around just scratching their chins and going, what has happened here? Well, Barb McClintock worked out um, the elements that actually caused this and then some study was done that's a very good, uh, actually, work related to retrotransposons that we're not talking about now. And then, uh, let's see, 60 years after retrotransposons were discovered, let me find the actual article itself. Here it is in the Public Library of Science 1, open source journal, absolutely fantastic journal. What year is this? 2012, yeah, so 60 years later. They actually studied all the clones of Pinot Noir and asked, what actually makes these clones different? Well, they did a family tree of all the clones, and what they found was they could actually differentiate all the clones based purely on these retrotransposons or jumping genes uh, that they have in their DNA. So, in other words, the retrotransposons were had... Uh, led to a majority of the variation that we actually see in Pinot Noir. It's amazing.
In fact, I just did a quick calculation uh, before this, uh, and about 85% of the variation found between Pinot and Noir clones was actually just due to these jumping genes, which have jumped around the place. Amazing. So I recommend that if you're interested in it, uh, look up this article here. It's pretty easy to read, actually, especially the introduction. I'm just looking at the window, there's a creepy person driving past the winery. Um, and it's free to read. It's open source. Um, and then there's another article, too, if anyone is interested. Um, retrotransposons in plants, engines of evolution. And what I like about this article as well is it goes a little bit further and asks, are retrotransposons just selfish things that take advantage of plants or are they actually working together with plants? And they actually provide some evidence to suggest that these jumping genes, uh, in some regards, actually work in partnership with plants um, to assist them during their lifetime and to assist in their evolution. Interesting stuff. So... So that's how we see that these retrotransposons can work to make one variety of Pinot different to another. And then we'll look at another wine made during lockdown, uh, and that's our Pinot Gris Gewurz from our vineyard. And we see that this, this wine is in fact white, but then our Pinot Gris from last year was in fact uh, pink. Um, an orangey pink and that's because actually there's another mutation that occurred in Pinot Noir that actually disrupted the color so much that it actually produces um, naturally sort of rosé colored wines uh, and that's called Pinot Gris or Pinot Grey actually referred to as a, a bronze skin variety. This wine if you Ferment your Pinot Gris on skins, you get the full expression of the colour, whereas this one here is white. And this one's white because the bushfires last year, if you can think back all that way pre-pandemic, um, were raging and we couldn't ferment these on skins because the smoke that was um, inhaled by the grapes um, would have led to smoke taint if we'd allowed them to soak too much. So instead we made a really zesty, delicious and quite fruity Pinot Gris with a little bit of Gewürz. Um, no evident smoke whatsoever, which is a triumph. Um, and it's super delicious. Now the, the genetics of Pinot Gris, how Pinot Noir gets to Pinot Gris, and then Pinot Gris gets to Pinot Blanc, is another fascinating story that involves not only retrotransposons, but also other types of genetic mutations as well. And because of these mutations, we can actually get Pinot Gris turning to Pinot Blanc, and sometimes Pinot Blanc going back to Pinot Gris. Now, that's a confusing situation for any uh, grape grower. If you're interested in more about this, um, and I'm sure you're not, feel free to send me an email. Um, but thank you for spending the time. Look out for these wines on the website and in fine wine purveyors around you, and I'll see you next time. Looking pure in my room, one chat, episode eight.